Hello and welcome back to the second part of Lecture 4. In this part of this lecture, we're going to do a little bit of revision about transport equations to start with. We're going to remind ourselves how transport equations are typically formulated, how they can be simplified, and really importantly, what each term in a transport equation actually means from a physical standpoint. Now, as we do this, we'll remind ourselves about the fact that transport equations are vectorial in nature, and what I want you to try and become is comfortable in using the vectorial form of a transport equation. Then what we're going to do is to introduce the first four steps of a seven-step process, another process, that we can use to convert a partial differential equation into a system of simultaneous algebraic equations. Now, we're going to illustrate this using the finite difference method because it's a nice, easy, straightforward thing to do. But you must remember that there is an analogous method that you can use using the finite volume method, which is directly pertinent to both open foam and to fluent. Now, the first four steps of this process is going to start by looking at simplifying the problem, then manipulating the partial differential equation to reflect that simplified problem. Then we're going to look at the boundary conditions. It's the boundary conditions that will drive the problem in our example. In fact, it's something called a boundary value problem. And then we're going to look at discretizing the solution domain using the finite difference method and basically a line of finite difference nodes. So let's start by revisiting and revising transport equations. You will have met transport equations a lot of times before and you will be familiar with them. You will have seen mass transport and energy transport and momentum transport. And these equations are really important in chemical engineering because they describe the spatial and temporal change of a quantity that is subject to advection in a fluid flow, to diffusion and also to generation and destruction as well. And a very neat visualisation is thinking about mass transport because you can have matter being convected in a flow, you can have matter diffusing in a flow or in a solid, and you can have chemical reactions that either generate or destroy certain species. However, transport equations are used far more widely than just those three examples. For example, in two-phase flow, you use transport equations to track the phase boundary between phase A and phase B. If you're modelling the behaviour of a fibre-reinforced polymer composite and you want to track the orientation and location of fibres, you can use a transport equation to examine how those fibres change orientation. It's quite a complex transport equation that involves fourth rank tensors, but nonetheless it is still a transport equation. So let's put on the whiteboard a reminder of what a transport equation is. There we go. There's my transport equation in simple form. On the left hand side, I have the time variation of a physical quantity A. A can be anything you like, but for the purposes of this example, I'm going to assume it's temperature. So A, somewhat um, unobviously, is temperature, and it changes with time. On the right hand side are terms that can drive that change in temperature with time. And one is a diffusion term, and the other is a source or sink term. Now, Let's think about this term by term, and let's start on the left-hand side about how things can change with time. So let's ask ourselves, how can temperature change with time? We can think of two physical mechanisms which allow that to happen. Let's do a mental experiment. Let's say we have a hot solid resting on a heatproof mat on a bench, and we take its temperature over time. It simply gets cooler. It'll eventually cool to the temperature of the ambient surroundings. It's just losing heat by natural convection. So the term I've written on the left-hand side in square brackets, partial dA by dt, reflects that physical process. You're observing, in this case, for example, a solid, and it's cooling down over time. Fine. That's just a time variation of temperature. Now let's think about that second term in square brackets. And we'll do another thought experiment to illustrate this. Rather than watching a hot solid cool down, let's imagine what we have is a pipe and a thermocouple embedded in that pipe to measure the fluid temperature. And at the entrance of the pipe, we start to feed in a hot fluid. And once the thermocouple is measuring that hot fluid, we gradually change to a cold fluid. And if we look at the data that we get from the thermocouple and plot it on the graph, we'll see temperature changing with time. However, it's not the same heat loss mechanism for that solid cooling on a heatproof mat, is it? 
what we have is a temperature change driven by the fluid flow. And so if we look at that second term in square brackets on the left hand side, we've got V, which is the vector field of velocity for my fluid. So it's got an X direction, a Y direction and a Z direction in Cartesian coordinates. Dot producted with a temperature gradient, grad A, which is dt dx, dt dy, dt dz, and is therefore a vector as well. So we've got a vector dot product with a vector, which of course gives us a scalar. And if we look at all the other terms in this transport equation, they too are scalar. Partial dA by partial dt is scalar. R subscript A is scalar. And so we've got to add scalar terms to scalar terms. We can't add a scalar term to a vector term. So turning our attention back to that second term in square brackets on the left hand side, whatever we have there has to give us a scalar. So we've got a velocity vector dot producted with a temperature gradient vector giving us a scalar. And taking a step back from the mathematical explanation of this, both of these terms will give us a change in temperature with respect to time. So partial dA by dt is simply how something changes with time, for example an object cooling. V dot grad A is a different physical mechanism. It's all around how flow can make a quantity change with time. And in this case, our mental model was a hot fluid followed by a cold fluid. And we're measuring this temperature at a given point in that flow system and watching the hot fluid go by and then go cold. So the left hand side of a transport equation is all about how these physical um, quantities, in this case, temperature change with time. The right hand side are terms that drive that temperature change. And so if we think back to our solid sitting on a mat cooling down, if we took the temperature at the core of that solid and the temperature at the outside edge of that solid, we'd see a difference over time between the two. And of course, that's driven by thermal conduction. And that's the term in blue on the right hand side. It's a diffusion based term. It's also a second derivative based term. It's a d2 by dx squared type term, grad squared. So the terms in blue are the amount of the property that we're looking at in the transport equation that is transferred by diffusive processes. And don't forget that thermal conduction is a diffusive process. The final term in that transport equation is the amount of the property that created or destroyed. And so if we imagine putting a bowl of water in a microwave and measuring its temperature as a function of time and we turn the microwaves on, as the water gets hit by the microwaves, it heats up. It, it drives a, a de-temperature by de-time type variation. However, what's happening now is you've got a heat source, and it's that heat source, not diffusion, that is driving that temperature change. Likewise, we could have our um, bowl of water sitting in a freezer, and we could record the temperature in that water over time, and we'd see it cooling down, and we'd see the system losing energy. And this is, of course, because it's in a heat sink. And so sometimes when we're looking at heat transfer to external surroundings, that RA term, that source or sink term, we can use to look at how the entity we're looking at will either lose or gain heat by convection to the surrounding area. So there's our transport equation. It just is simply describing how something changes with time and it relates how that something changes to factors that can change it. Now, we've been talking in our previous example about energy transport. So let's formally look at energy transport now. And here on the whiteboard is indeed the energy transport equation. Rho Cp dt by dt on the left hand side. On the right hand side, k grad squared t plus Ra. So rho is density, Cp is heat capacity, k is thermal conductivity, Ra is my rate of loss or gain of energy per unit volume. Now, as before, we can simplify out the left hand side. And we recognise, again, that temperature can change with time according to a number of different physical mechanisms. And we can see that we've got our partial d-temperature by partial d-time, and also our velocity field vector dotted with our temperature gradient vector. Both of these will drive a temperature change with time. So now what we also need to remember is, of course, we've got something called a heat flux. And heat flux is a vector quantity, because if you think about heat passing through a, an area, if we have a unit cuboid, 
we can see that we can get heat passing through the X face, the Y face and the Z face. And so heat flux, therefore, can have an X component, a Y component and a Z component. And we can write heat flux in terms of a thermal conductivity multiplied by a temperature gradient. Now, thinking about we can only add scalar to scalar and vector to vector, if heat flux is a vector, the right-hand side of this equation also has to be vector. Now, assuming that we've got isotropic physical properties, that is to say a constant thermal conductivity in each of my three coordinate directions, which isn't always the case, we know that grad T therefore has to be vector. So we've got my temperature gradient vector once again. And we can, if we want, insert heat flux into my energy transport equation. If we look at the K grad squared T term on the right hand side, that can be rewritten in terms of heat flux in terms of minus grad dot Q. And there's a dot product there, because don't forget the Q is vector, and that all the other terms in the transport equation are scalar. And so we have to have an operation here that yields a scalar quantity. And if we take grad now as being dt, d by dx, d by dy, d by dz as a vector, dot product that with qx, qy and qz, then that dot product operation gives us scalar terms. So don't forget that you can rewrite energy equation in flux terms and in general terms you can rewrite any transport equation in a flux based formulation as well. Now let's think about using vector form. So here on the whiteboard is my transport equation, energy transport, that we're becoming deeply familiar with. And it's very advantageous to keep transport equations in vector form to start with when you're setting up numerical solutions. And I'll illustrate in a few slides time as to why this is the case. So you need to get comfortable with using transport equations in vector form because it cuts through the complications that a given geometry can bring. If we were to drop this transport equation into, say, spherical polar coordinates, you end up with a really, really long equation and it becomes quite unclear which terms in that equation belong to each of the terms here. And don't forget that each of these terms, as we've written them, belong to a particular physical process. And so if we can keep thinking physically, then we can very easily simplify these transport equations when written in vector form. If they're expanded out into a coordinate system, we lose that clarity. So I urge you to think about keeping that clarity to start with and only to translate the vector form into the relevant coordinate system when you've done all the simplification you have to do. You make far fewer errors. Now, don't forget your departmental data book has vector form of transport equations, pages 16 and 17, or pages 26 to 28 for fluid flow for Navier-Stokes. And so that, again, helps you to make sure you don't write out terms in, say, spherical polar coordinates incorrectly. Now, it's worth mentioning at this point a slight aside, which is the reference frame in which we serve, solve a transport equation. There are two. You'll hear about Eulerian reference frames. Now, this is effectively your, an external observer looking at a system happening. And so the reference frame is stationary. The finite difference nodes or the finite volume mesh doesn't move with the problem. And so illustratively, we might just watch a fluid flowing along a tube. And the tube in which that fluid flows is discretized. And that discretization doesn't adapt to the flow at all. That's an Eulerian reference frame. Its counterpart is a Lagrangian reference frame, which is, in effect, rather than looking at the fluid as an external observer, we travel with the fluid. And so it's a mobile reference frame. And the solution grid or mesh deforms with the motion that's inherent to the problem. And so you can imagine that each of these terms, each of these methods has pros and cons. Um, we're going to be talking about Eulerian reference frames uniquely in this course, but sometimes it's easy to simplify a transport equation if you place it in the Lagrangian reference frame. But then sometimes the geometry handling can become somewhat difficult. So this is just a point of note, something to remember, 
we're going to be using Eulerian reference frames. Now, let's have a look at how we start this seven step process, how we get our transport equation and how we solve it numerically. Now, so let's have a look at this with the finite difference method. And we're going to go back to our heat transfer problem that we saw in the previous part of this lecture. So I've got one dimensional heat transfer from a hot end to a cold end. We have no temperature gradients in the y direction because we've got solid insulation. We only have a temperature gradient in the x direction as the material goes from hot to cold. And this is a boundary value problem because the temperature profile within this material that's going from hot to cold depends entirely on what T1 is at one end and how much heat is being removed in terms of a heat flux at the other end. So those two things, that T1 and that heat flux, are the boundary conditions. Hence, we call this a boundary value problem. Now, let's start with step one by simplifying the problem and choosing the physics. Really important to sit down and think about the problem that you're solving to start with and to put it in its simplest form that is fit for purpose. Now, we're going to make some assumptions. We're going to say that this problem is at steady state. There's no time dependence. All the time dependence has already passed and we've got a steady gradient. We're going to say that actually the heat transfer here is in a solid. There is no fluid motion whatsoever. Furthermore, we're going to say there's no heat sources or heat sinks, and that we've got a Cartesian geometry, so we can keep the derivatives nice and easy. We've already said that heat transport is in one direction only, but let's formalise it. This is a one-dimensional problem. The only gradients present are x-direction gradients, dt by dx. We're furthermore going to assume isotropic physical properties. That is to say that your thermal conductivity is the same in the x direction as it is in the y direction as it is in the z direction. This isn't some microstructured material where you might have fibres running along one direction that offer an easy conduction path compared to the conduction perpendicular to them. So all material properties are isotropic. We're also going to say that the insulation is perfect, which is what actually makes this a one-dimensional problem. So, we sit down, we simplify our problem. This is a really, really important step. Now, the second step is to get our transport equation, we get the assumptions of our simplification, and we match the two together. This is why we want to keep the transport equation in vector form, because it makes this simplification step really nice and easy. So, let's write our energy equation in vector form. I've expanded out the total derivative there on the left-hand side. Partial d temperature by d time and v dot grad t, my advection term. On the right-hand side, if you'll note, I've divided through by rho cp. So I've got k over rho cp, del squared t, and ra over rho cp, my heat source or heat sink term normalised by rho cp. So that's the statement of energy equation. Let's start to now simplify it in accordance with the assumptions that we've just made. Our problem is steady state. That means there is no time derivative of temperature, so we can ignore partial dt by dt. The second thing we said was that the heat conduction happens in a solid. There is no fluid motion, therefore that velocity vector v is 0, 0, 0. Three zeros because it's a 3D vector. So we can get rid of all the terms on the left-hand side. That's rather handy. We said also that there are no heat sources or heat sinks in this problem, and so we can get rid of that heat source or sink term on the right-hand side. And all we're left with is this equation here. We're going to drop it into Cartesian coordinates because we said that we're using a Cartesian coordinate system, and we can see that that del squared t, because there's only gradients in x direction just simplifies straight away to d2t by dx squared. Look how easy it is to get to that main partial differential equation if we simplify using vector form. It's far less opportunity to make an error. So always simplify your transport equations in vector form, please. And if we compare this equation to what we had in the last part of this lecture, k over rho cp there, we had in our last part of this lecture taking the value 2. And so that's the origin of 0 equals 2 d2t by dx squared, is this simplification.
Now, we've simplified our partial differential equation. Now we need to define boundary conditions. So let's look back at our problem again. On the left hand side, we have a constant temperature that's hot, temperature T1. So we're going to say that when x, our coordinate is zero, because our origin is on the left hand side, T equals T1. Doesn't change, just T equals T1. We know what T1 is, we're specifying T1. It's our hot temperature. That's a nice easy boundary condition. On our right hand side though, if you look at what I've written there, say there's a constant heat flux. I haven't put a temperature there. I've said you're losing a certain amount of energy per unit time. And if we think about heat flux, remember that heat flux Q is usually a vector, but we're only worried about a 1D problem. So the only bit of that vector that exists is QX, which I've written as just italic Q here, which is equal to minus K dt by dx. K being thermal conductivity, dt dx, x direction temperature gradient. So that's just a statement of the definition of thermal conductivity, Q equals minus K dt dx. If we think about convective heat loss from a surface, as engineers, we will know that we can quantify that heat flux by means of a heat transfer coefficient H, units watts per meter squared per Kelvin, times a temperature driving force, T minus T ambient. And T in this case is whatever temperature that is arrived at at the end of this geometry. T infinity is the ambient temperature. So our heat flux here is equal to minus K dt dx equals H T minus T infinity at X equals L. And these two boundary conditions fully define our problem. Without proper definition of our boundary conditions, the model just won't work. And hence the reason why this is called a boundary value problem. Now let's look at the final step, which is starting to discretize the solution domain. And we've seen a sketch of this before, but I'd like to formalize it. And if we think about our solution domain, we're going to put a series of points spanning from hot to cold. Remember, I called these nodes. And I'll put quite a few in there, 20, 30, 40 or thereabouts. And what we're going to do is we're going to manipulate our partial differential equation into such a form that it just ends up being a series of additions and subtractions. Computers are incredibly good and very quick at adding and subtracting. They're not very good at analytically solving partial differential equations. So in order to facilitate this, we're going to break up our partial differential equation on this array of nodes, this, this line of points, and we'll break it up into a form that just involves addition and subtraction. So we're going to introduce a notation convention for these nodes. On the left hand side at the hot boundary, we've got node number one. On the right hand side, where we have the final node in our boundary, next to that heat flux boundary condition, we have node big N. Okay, so they're big N nodes in our solution domain. At a general point anywhere between one and N, I've got a generic node I. Now, when we do differencing, we're going to have to relate what happens in one point to its nearest neighbours. And so having a notation to describe what our arbitrary point is we're choosing is quite important. So I is an arbitrary point in the geometry away from the boundaries. And its nearest neighbour nodes are I plus one and I minus one. So let's recap some key points before we go on to use these nodes I, I plus one and I minus one to evaluate gradients. The first key point is really don't be afraid of transport equations. When written in vector form, they're actually really easy to simplify and easy to use. They should be your friend, okay? So always simplify boundary um, transport equations using vector form. First step, make assumptions about your problem. Make your problem as simple as it can be that's still fit for purpose. Don't overcomplicate things. However, don't oversimplify either. You still need to make your problem fit for purpose. Keep it as simple as it needs to be to work, but no simpler. You then simplify your partial differential equation or your transport equation in accordance with these assumptions. You establish the mathematical nature of your boundary conditions and you discretize your solution domain.